Good evening and welcome to evening prayer for Wednesday, September the 2nd. Today is the commemoration of Hannah. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Let my prayer rise before you as incense, the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. Joyous light of glory of the immortal Father, heavenly, holy, blessed Jesus Christ, we have come to the setting of the sun, and we look to the evening light. We sing to God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You are worthy of being praised with pure voices forever. O Son of God, O giver of life, the universe proclaims your glory. The Lord Almighty grant us a quiet night and peace at the last. Amen. It is good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praise to your name, O Most High, to herald your love in the morning, your truth at the close of the day. Praise to you, O Christ. O come, let us worship him. Lord Jesus, stay with us, for the evening is at hand and the day is past. Be our constant companion on the way. Kindle our hearts and awaken hope among us, that we may recognize you as you are revealed in the scriptures and in the breaking of the bread. Grant this for your name's sake. Amen. I give you thanks, O Lord, with my whole heart. Before the gods I sing your praise. I bow down toward your holy temple and give thanks to your name for your steadfast love and your faithfulness. For you have exalted above all things your name and your word. On the day I called, you answered me. My strength of soul you increased. All the kings of the earth shall give you thanks, O Lord. For they have heard the words of your mouth, and they shall sing of the ways of the Lord. For great is the glory of the Lord. For though the Lord is high, he regards the lowly, but the haughty he knows from afar. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, you preserve my life. You stretch out your hand against the wrath of my enemies, and your right hand delivers me. The Lord will fulfill his purpose for me. Your steadfast love, O Lord, endures forever. Do not forsake the work of your hands. Our New Testament reading tonight is from Ephesians chapter 2. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of works that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Therefore remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands. Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility, by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances, that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. For through him we have both have access in one spirit to the Father, so then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure, being joined together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also were being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. Today is the day the church commemorates the life of Hannah. Hannah was the favored wife of of Elkanah, and the devout mother of the prophet Samuel. 
He was born to her after years of bitter barrenness, 1 Samuel 1, 6-8, and fervent prayers for a son, 1 Samuel 1, 9-18. After she weaned her son, Hannah expressed her gratitude by returning him for service in the house of the Lord at Shiloh, 1 Samuel 1, 24-28. Her prayer, or psalm of thanksgiving, 1 Samuel 2, 1-10, begins with the words, My heart exalts in the Lord, my strength is exalted in the Lord. This song foreshadows the Magnificat, the Song of Mary, centuries later, Luke 1, 46-55. The name Hannah derives from the Hebrew word for grace. She is remembered and honored for joyfully having kept the vow she made before her son's birth and offering him for lifelong service to God. Our Book of Concord reading today is a continuation of the Apology of the Augsburg Confession, Article 5, on love and fulfilling the law. We could also call this article about the gospel, and we could also call it about sanctification. It's actually about all of those things. And we are beginning about in the middle of paragraph 80, where we left off last night. Paul also teaches this about works when he says in Romans 4, 9-25, that Abraham received circumcision. He did not seek to be justified by this work, for he had already attained justification through faith. He was counted righteous. But circumcision was added so that A, Abraham might have a written sign in his body, B, admonished by this, he might exercise faith, and C, by this work, he might also confess his faith before others, and by his testimony, invite others to believe. By faith, Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice, Hebrews 11.4. Because he was just by faith, the sacrifice that he made was pleasing to God. It is not that he merited forgiveness of sins and grace by this work, but he exercised his faith and showed it to others in order to invite them to believe. In this way, good works ought to follow faith. Yet people who cannot believe and be sure that they are freely forgiven for Christ's sake and that freely they have a reconciled God for Christ's sake, use works in a far different way. When they see the works of saints, they judge in a human way that saints have merited forgiveness of sins and grace through these works. So they imitate them, thinking that through similar works they merit forgiveness of sins and grace. They think that through these works they appease God's wrath and are counted righteous for the sake of these works. We condemn this godless opinion about works. In the first place, it hides Christ's glory when people offer to God these works as a price in atonement. This honor, due to Christ alone, is credited to our works. Second, they do not find peace of conscience in these works. In true terrors, heaping up works upon works, they eventually despair because they find no work pure, important, and precious enough. The law always accuses and produces wrath. Third, such persons never attain the knowledge of God. For in anger they run from God who judges and afflicts them. They never believe that they are heard. But faith shows God's presence, since it is certain that God freely forgives and hears us. Furthermore, this godless opinion about works has always existed in the world. The heathen had sacrifices derived from the fathers. They imitated their works. They did not maintain their faith, but thought that the works were an atonement and price by which God could be reconciled to them. The people in the law, the Israelites, imitated sacrifices with the opinion that they would appease God by means of these works, so to say, ex opera operato. We see here how seriously the prophets rebuke the people. Psalm 50, verse 8. Not for your sacrifices do I rebuke you. And Jeremiah 7.22, I did not speak to your fathers or command them concerning burnt offerings and sacrifices. Such passages do not condemn works, which God certainly had commanded as outward exercises in this government. They condemn the godless opinion that people thought that by their works they are appeasing God's wrath, and so cast away faith. Because no works ease the conscience, new works, in addition to God's commands, were made up from time to time. The people of Israel had seen the prophets sacrificing on high places. See 1 Samuel 9, verse 10 to 14 and 19. Besides, the examples of the saints very greatly moved the minds of people who hoped to obtain grace by similar works, just as these saints received it. Therefore, the people began with remarkable zeal to imitate their work, in order that by such work they might merit forgiveness of sins, grace, and righteousness. But the prophets had been, had been sacrificing on high places, not so that they merit forgiveness of sins and grace by these works, but because they taught on these places. So they presented a testimony of their faith there. 
The people had heard that Abraham had sacrificed his son, Genesis 22. Therefore they also, in order to appease God by a most cruel and difficult work, put their sons to death. See 2 Kings 16.3. But Abraham did not sacrifice his son with the opinion that this work was a price and atoning work by which he was counted righteous. In a similar way, the Lord's Supper was instituted in the church. So by remembering Christ's promises about which we are taught in the sacrament, faith would be strengthened in us, and we would publicly confess our faith and proclaim Christ's benefits, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 11.26, For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. But our adversaries contend that the Mass is a work that justifies us by the outward work, ex opera operato, and removes the guilt and liability to punishment in those for whom it is celebrated. That's what Gabriel Beale writes. Anthony, Bernard, Dominic, Francis, and other Holy Fathers selected a certain kind of life, either for the sake of study or other useful exercises. In the meantime, they believed that by faith they were counted righteous for Christ's sake, and that God was gracious to them, not because of their own exercises. But the multitude since then has imitated not the faith of the fathers, but their example without faith. By such works, the multitude thought they might merit forgiveness of sins, grace, and forgiveness. They did not believe that they received these freely on account of Christ as the atoning sacrifice. The world judges that all works are an atonement by which God is appeased. They are a price by which we are counted righteous. It does not believe that Christ is the atonement. It does not believe that through faith we are freely counted righteous for Christ's sake. Since works cannot ease the conscience, other works are continually chosen, new rites are performed, new vows are made, and new orders of monks are formed beyond God's command, in order that some great work may be sought that may be set against God's wrath and judgment. Contrary to Scripture, the adversaries uphold these godless opinions about works, they say these things about our works, that they are in an atonement, they merit forgiveness of sins and grace, and we are counted righteous before God by them, and not through faith, for Christ's sake, as the atonement. What is this other than to deny Christ the honor of mediator and atoning sacrifice? We believe and teach that good works must be done, fulfilling of the law ought to follow faith. Nevertheless, we give Christ his own honor. We believe and teach that through faith for Christ's sake we are counted righteous before God. We are not counted righteous because of works without Christ as mediator. We do not merit forgiveness of sins, grace, and righteousness by works. We cannot set our works against God's wrath and justice. Works cannot overcome the terrors of sin. But the terrors of sin are overcome through faith alone. Only Christ the mediator is to be presented by faith against God's wrath and judgment. If anyone thinks differently, he does not give Christ due honor. Christ has been set forth so that he might be in atonement, that through him we might have access to the Father. We are speaking now about the righteousness through which we approach God, not humans, but by which we receive grace and peace of conscience. Conscience, however, cannot be eased before God unless through faith alone. Faith is certain that God for Christ's sake is reconciled to us, according to Romans 5.1, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace. This is justification. This is because justification is only a matter freely promised for Christ's sake. Therefore, it is always received before God through faith alone. That is where we end tonight. Tomorrow night we'll begin a section of this article called Passages That the Adversaries Misuse. So we will see uh, how various Bible verses have been misinterpreted. Uh, regarding our justification. We join in the Apostles' Creed in the Lord's Prayer. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses 
as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. O Lord, have mercy. O Christ, have mercy. O Lord, have mercy. O Christ, have mercy. God the Father in heaven, have mercy. God the Son, Redeemer of the world, have mercy. God the Holy Spirit, have mercy. Be gracious to us. Spare all the dying. From all sin, from all evil, from the devil's might, from the devil's wiles, from your wrath and from hell's torment, from sudden and evil death, good Lord, deliver them. By the mystery of your holy incarnation, by your holy nativity, by your agony and bloody sweat, by your cross and passion, by your precious death and burial, by your glorious resurrection and ascension, and by the grace of the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, help them, good Lord. In the hour of death, on the day of judgment, help them, good Lord. We poor sinners implore you to hear us, good Lord. To comfort all the dying, to forgive them all their sins, to lead them out of this misery into eternal life. We implore you to hear us, good Lord. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, we implore you to hear us. Christ, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, have mercy. Christ, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, have mercy. Christ, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, grant us your peace. O Christ, hear us. O Lord, have mercy. O Christ, have mercy. O Lord, have mercy. Amen. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have graciously kept me this day. And I pray that you would forgive me all my sins where I have done wrong, and graciously keep me this night. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul, and all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good night.